our um, second in a four-part series of Smilo Shares on prostate cancer and survivorship. Uh, tonight, I have the pleasure of being with um, Dr. Preston Sprankle. He is an associate professor of urology, he specializes in the treatment of urologic cancers, including prostate cancer, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, testicular cancer, and sarcoma. I'm also joined by Jevin Britta, who's a PA in our survivorship program of the Smilo Cancer Hospital, and Kelsey Willis, who is a candidate in clinical psychology, currently completing her residency at Yeoman Haven Hospital. So just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, there is a Q&A box, um, so you can put your questions in as you think of them. You can, um, we'll answer them sort of at the end. We'll save a little bit of time instead of after each speaker. Um, but if each of the speakers wants to answer anything on their own, they can just um, pop in when you can. Um, we also have Dr. Petrolak, who logged in, I think, now. Thank you. Good evening. With my computer, my, my uh, web browser froze and I couldn't get out of it. Oh, no. Okay. So I did just some brief intros, except for yours. So I'll let you do it, and then you can start the show. Terrific. We've got a wonderful panel here tonight, and I'm um, Dr. Petrolak. I'm the... Uh, head of the GU DART, which is the GU research program, as well as the uh, section chief for gender oncology. And uh, we really gonna be talking tonight about ways in which our providers can interact with each other. So what I'd like to do is just bring up some slides about the multidisciplinary approach to this disease. If we can get those up on the screen. It's really the, the old adage, two heads are, or three heads are better than one, I think really does come into play here. Uh, when you have specialists who specialize in different areas of prostate cancer treatment, namely surgery, radiation oncology, imaging or radiology, radiation treatment, as I mentioned before, um, pathology, all of these healthcare professionals work together to give you the best possible care for this disease. And uh, I think that if you could just get my slides up. Okay, I don't see them yet. Unless you want to put mine up, we could share them. What if that's one way of doing that. Uh, but basically, you know, this is what I think it's important to bring uh, all different aspects of the patient's care together, not only the, the medical part, but the psychosocial parts as well, because the prostate cancer has a major impact, not only on um, the uh, family, the patient, but as well as the family. So we're still waiting for the slides to come up. Not perfect. So uh, let's go to the first slide. And, and what, what I'm talking about is the multidisciplinary approach it involves all treating clinicians, urologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and potentially the primary care physician, because those are the individuals uh, who uh, are basically doing the PSA screening and are helping to detect disease earlier. Other key members could include a nutritionist, mental health professionals, pain management experts, and those who focus on treating the patient at each stage of the cancer disease to support timely and appropriate care. Next slide, please. And um, this is, uh, there are a couple of studies that have actually shown that this approach where you, you're using uh, groups together, and it doesn't have to be a physical multidisciplinary clinic, it could be doctors that are working together. In fact, my office, I'm an oncologist, my office is in the urology department, and the doctors you'll be speaking to tonight can always, we always talk to each other. It could be different hours and different times. We have tumor boards where we present cases together and review them. So. Um, this was a study of uh, my, my good friend, Dr. Lenny Gamella from Jefferson, where he looked at the benefits of multidisciplinary approach for high-risk, locally advanced prostate cancer patients. And it showed that when you look at the SEER data, which is the Medicare database, there seemed to be an improvement in survival. And it seems that the high-risk patients benefit the most. And 
Dave Crawford at the University of Colorado, when he was there, also did a very similar study. And they found that uh, they seem to be, for the multidisciplinary approach compared to the databases, there seemed to be an elevated survival rate in that region. Next slide, please. So what will go, our goals, what are they? We want to make the best possible care. We want to optimize patient outcomes. We want to improve the access to specialty therapies, which we do through our clinical trials, as well as some of our other diagnostic techniques. We want to look both at efficacy for patients as well as clinician schedules to coordinate the care to avoid redundancies and then to improve communication. That's key, Letting, making sure your providers communicating with each other through the entire course of the patient survivorship to be sure that they get the best of possible care. Next slide. So uh, this is actually something that was uh, from a couple of years ago, but I think it's true. We have a manpower shortage or person power shortage in both urology and medical oncology. And uh, there's a pipeline explosion of new drugs, which is coupled with uh, healthcare constraints. We're having more trouble finding personnel. And of course, there's limited amounts of what you can do in terms of, of, of the dollar. And we feel that the multidisciplinary approach that we're going to be talking about tonight is the only way to maximize the synergies of patient care. So let's get go to our first speaker. I believe that's Dr. I have a Dr. Sprinkle, I believe, correct? So Dr. Sprinkle's gonna be talking about prostate cancer detection and early stage disease. Hi, um, so I don't have any slides, but I just wanted to kind of outline how we discuss and evaluate patients or men with prostate cancer and evaluate for prostate cancer recurrence. Um, it is largely based on uh, blood test, blood testing. Um, and the PSA blood test is how we evaluate for, for possible actual recurrence of prostate cancer. I um, know we're gonna talk more about the fear of cancer recurrence in some of the later presentations. Um, but I think the very important thing to recognize is that even if we have a suspicion that a prostate cancer has recurred, we do have many different types of additional therapies that are available. Um, and just because we see some changes in this PSA marker does not necessarily mean that a cancer is recurring that needs to be treated. Um, let me just check something quickly. <clears throat> and other significant things that are pretty important to recognize is we have new um, imaging technologies and techniques that help us evaluate for prostate cancer recurrence. And you know that help us understand is, are these recurrences localized or are they potentially uh, somewhere outside the prostate. And, and again, we have multiple therapies that, uh, along with Dr. Petrolak, we're able to identify and determine uh, which of these are most appropriate based on, again, PSA testing and, and these new imaging tests that we have. One of these exciting new imaging tests is called a PSMA PET CT. Um, we do have that available uh, at Yale in the Yale and the Smilo Cancer Center. Um, and this is really change the way that we evaluate these patients for metastatic disease. Um, and so that has become a mainstay for how we are evaluating these men where we have a concern for prostate cancer recurrence. And I'll, I think, leave it there and happy to answer questions as they come in. Hey, Kelsey, I think you're up next. You can. All right, awesome. We're gonna share my screen with y'all. My name is Kelsey. I am the Clinical Psychology Fellow in Behavioral Medicine. Let's see, I think I need to do this. Is that better? Okay, great, awesome. Um, I am interested in helping patients with a variety of cancer cope with the diagnosis and survivorship and all the different emotions that come up. And so I wanna to talk to you all tonight from a psychological standpoint, what is fear of cancer recurrence? What is this term we keep saying? And what can we do from it about it from a psychological standpoint? Um, I'm supervised by Dr. Dwayne Fayon and Dr. Jennifer Kilkis, if either of you, if you've had contact with any of them. Um, they're clinical psychologists, specialize in the field of psycho-oncology. 
And um, this field has started to study something that we call FCR. So what is fear of cancer recurrence? So what we know is that when you're diagnosed with something like cancer, the C word, um, it can trigger a variety of emotions and that's natural. We know that um, men with prostate cancer or survivors um, feel a lot of different feelings. That can be depression, anxiety, shame, um, uncertainty. And one specific type of anxiety is called fear of cancer recurrence. Now I want to tell y'all that FCR is normal. Almost every patient will experience some symptoms of FCR. Um, only one in three men with prostate cancer cancer will endorse symptoms that we as psychologists would say are in the clinical range, okay? So what do I need, mean by clinical range? Clinical range is where we start to get a little concerned and it's really impairing your quality of life, okay? So you're having thoughts about the cancer recurring very frequently, most of the day, um, most days of the week. You might be hypervigilant to bodily symptoms, maybe um, over interpreting all different types of signs as a cancer recurring. Um, you might be engaging in frequent reassurance seeking behaviors that could be reaching out to your doctor, um, getting multiple scans, um, just trying to get information constantly that your cancer has not come back. And really most importantly is this last piece, it's your fear um, or preoccupation with the cancer coming back is um, impairing your daily functioning and overall quality of life. One other thing I want you to know about FCR is that it doesn't really matter what your prognosis is. Um, no matter what it is, anyone can have FCR. It doesn't have to, you don't have to just have a bad prognosis to F F FCR. And um, there's another presenter who will be speaking about some risk factors for FCR, but even if you have a low chance of your cancer coming back, you can still be preoccupied with the thought of it coming back. Um, and that is something that um, we as psychologists um, and your medical team can help you navigate in a variety of ways. So um, I put up this questionnaire and I invite you to take a picture of it if you'd like. It's called the Fear of Cancer Recurrence Scale 7. There are seven questions. And this is one of the clinical tools that has been uh, developed to measure um, a person's level of FCR. So like I said, I doubt that um, people will have zero symptoms. You'll probably have at least one symptom, um, but it is those that are um, scoring a 17 or greater, if you add up your number, that we would suggest um, might need more treatment or might need more attention for managing these symptoms, just kind of like depression. You know, everyone feels sad, but sometimes um, your sadness can become uh, a little bit moderate to severe, and that's when it's time to seek help. Okay, so I just provide just a little bit of background information of what is this um, psychological phenomenon we call fear of cancer recurrence. But let's talk a little bit about what you can do. Okay, so I'm going to just throw out a lot of ideas here, and these are things that I um, do with my patients that uh, present with FCR, and some of these might appeal to you and others might, may not, and that's okay. Um, a lot of the evidence-based treatments for fear of cancer recurrence have these components. So the first is mindfulness or relaxation exercises. There's great apps, Headspace Calm, um, to kind of get you into the present moment when your mind is racing and taking off. Different relaxation exercises like body scanning, um, deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation can be other tools to get you into the present. We always encourage uh, folks to kind of carry their fears with them instead of maybe having them um, sit in the driver's seat, maybe to sit in the back seat or the trunk and to take their fears with them while they engage in still those hobbies that are most meaningful to them. Definitely encourage that. Exercise can be a great way um, to reduce anxiety just generally, including fear of cancer recurrence. And that may look differently um, as a survivor. You may, instead of running, you may be walking and that's okay. This is a big one. And this is what something you would do in therapy 
is recognizing what emotions you're having, what fears and thoughts you're having, um, instead of avoiding them or suppressing them. Because just because you try to um, push them away doesn't mean that they actually go away. So journaling could be a way to do that. Um, challenging unhelpful or illogical thoughts. You know, maybe you have some evidence from your medical team that you're in a good place medically. And even though you were having this fear, can you use counter evidence to challenge um, the places your brain is going? Thinking about what's in your control, sleep, diet, healthy behaviors, letting go what is not, um, and staying informed. We're all here tonight as different professions to um, give you different perspectives, but it's really important to keep in contact with your medical team so you really understand okay, where am I medically, what are my risk factors, and really informing yourself with the, the best knowledge. Um, and last but not least, don't keep it all inside. I think that would be my biggest takeaway. If you're struggling with some of these thoughts and it feels like it's um, taking away some of your joy, um, talk to a friend. And if you don't feel like you have a safe space in your life, join a support group. I know there's a variety at Smilo and there's some online as well. Um, and if that doesn't appeal to you, I definitely recommend talk therapy. Um, I myself, I'm trained in um, interventions for fear of cancer recurrence. There's some other of us as well. Um, just wanted to put a few resources and feel free to take a picture of this slide as well. Um, at Smilo, we have psychiatry, we have individual psychotherapy, we have support groups. You can also find um, psychologists through Psychology Today, counselors who can help you navigate some of these fears. Um, and because fear of cancer recurrence is a type of specific cancer-related distress that's highly studied, there's a lot of really cool treatments that are coming out. Um, there is a digital treatment called I Conquer Feel Fear that's coming out soon through Blue Note Therapeutics. And because y'all, we are in the great state of Connecticut and between New York and Boston, there's a lot of clinical trials around us. Um, that are specifically to understand how to best treat uh, fear of cancer recurrence. So I definitely would recommend keeping your eye out for those um, as well. That's all I have. Here's my email address. You can follow me on Twitter. I tweet about these types of problems all the time. Um, thank you. And if you have any questions, let me know. So I have, I have a quick, quick question. Um, Prostate cancer is sort of unique. I guess maybe ovarian cancer would be the other one that has this issue, but you have serum tumor markers that can go up without having any evidence of cancer recurrence. So how, how do you deal with that differently than, let's say, for example, a person who may have a more concrete evidence of recurrence? It's difficult. I mean, how do you live with uncertainty is really the question that I'm hearing. Um, and it's definitely a difficult tightrope to walk, um, you know, with my patients, what I would do is to find out ways that they can manage the uncertainty and still live a meaningful life, sort of to hold both at the same time. Okay, I think... Devin, I think you're up. All right. Thanks, Heather. And I'm just going to pull up my slideshow here. I think I'm all the way at the end here, so let me back up. All right. We're in the right place now. So hi, everyone. As, uh, as was mentioned earlier and just by Heather there, my name is Jevin. I'm the physician assistant with the Yale uh, Survivorship Program. And just to give you a brief introduction to that, I'm part of this multidisciplinary clinic called the Survivorship Clinic. So I work alongside with my colleagues, um, Scott Capoza, our oncology certified physical therapist, Angela Kerala, who's our licensed clinical social worker. And we're under our medical director, Dr. Tara Samft, who's a medical oncologist at Smilo as well. Um, and our program coordinator, she's on the front lines. Um, her name is Angelique, or she goes by Kiki Williams. Um, so if you ever find yourself coming to see us, um, you'll be speaking with her in all likelihood first, and she'll help you get in for an appointment. Um, I listed our contact information here, so you can certainly screenshot that, take a picture, put it down in your phone, um, and you can certainly reach out if you'd like to come in and see us. So 
what we do is we focus on, um, you know, life after cancer. And that can be from the time of diagnosis um, on, really. And so usually we see people once they've completed their active portion of treatment. And we talk about a lot of things ranging from diagnosis, the treatment you've received, and follow-up recommendations. And we put that into a nice summary called a survivorship care plan that you get on the day of your visit. We also provide a folder of resources for you to have on um, different um, topics like well-being um, and healthy lifestyle uh, behaviors. Um, and so that way you have that along with some uh, supportive resources at Smilo as well. And we talk about uh, potential side effects from treatment, ongoing late effects. Uh, we discuss healthy lifestyle recommendations, encompassing physical activity and nutrition. And uh, we can refer you to our network of dietitians at Smilo as well. Um, and we also talk about the psychosocial side of things, and that can be mental health related concerns um, like Kelsey specializes in. And um, also uh, along those lines, fear of cancer recurrence, which is just by chance the topic we're discussing tonight. So I'll go ahead and jump right in. So you might notice there are uh, some similarities here between um, what Kelsey and I are talking about because a lot of what we discuss are, uh, you know, very similar. Um, however, I'm coming at it from the survivorship standpoint and as a medical oncology provider. So fear of cancer recurrence uh, or FCR is um, the most, is arguably the most common experience that cancer survivors have. Um, and it occurs in, you know, about 50 to 70% of survivors. And as uh, it was highlighted before too, it is absolutely normal. That is first and foremost, something to keep in mind. And you might notice certain themes like that coming up tonight and even just in my own uh, presentation here. It can happen uh, to anybody at any stage in their disease. And really the important thing to start doing when you notice you're having fear of cancer recurrence is discuss it with your care team. And that can help reduce suffering from it, improve communication and rapport with your providers and help prevent more severe fear of cancer recurrence as well. So um, one thing we try to be aware of as providers too is who's most vulnerable for fear of recurrence. We tend to see it in younger cancer survivors, um, those who might have more life ahead of them, ahead of them with more milestones to consider. Um, those who have a higher perception, uh, a perception of a higher risk of recurrence, whether that's true or not, um, it's a matter of that perception. And so some people who have that concern that they're at a higher risk for recurrence um, have that elevated fear of cancer recurrence with that. Um, people who have more severe side effects can also experience higher levels of fear of recurrence, um, who've had a past medical history with an anxiety disorder or other mental health conditions, a history of trauma, or um, having loved ones in your lives that have experienced cancer in their own way, um, whether in the past and have passed on um, or are currently going through it. Um, these can all be reminders and triggers for fear of recurrence. So what does it look like? Um, here I wanna break down you know, a more mild case um, of fear of recurrence and a more moderate to severe experience of it. And that milder um, scenario is when you have occasional thoughts about cancer and recurrence or progression of disease. And that can be associated with these external triggers, things like follow-up appointments, going for uh, imaging or labs, surveillance for your cancer, like um, you know, Dr. Sprankel mentioned um, some of the imaging and, and the PSA levels. Um, and also um, others being around you uh, with cancer themselves. And something that we struggle with as a clinic, and we wish we had this pie in the sky place to go for our, our survivorship program, uh, we share space uh, with other clinics as well. And sometimes people will come in to see us and they have some heightened anxiety just from being back in that clinical space, um, perhaps sometimes even where they had treatment and saw their care team. And so it's important to be mindful of that, that these triggers exist and, and develop coping strategies to work, with, uh, to work on those. Um, but usually in milder cases, um, it's, it's easier to find those coping strategies and um, fear of occurrence actually improves over time. 
In moderate to severe cases of fear of cancer recurrence, though, um, that doesn't always happen. And it can be involving more intrusive thoughts uh, that are more frequent um, and doesn't always have to come with a trigger. And there can be this perceived inability to actually be able to control those thoughts leading to a stronger sense of distress as well. So thinking about, you know, yes, you could be more predisposed if you had a history of anxiety, but also it can lead to increased anxiety as well. Um, and the important thing to remember here when you're having more significant thoughts of fear of cancer recurrence, where it's, you know, uh, changing your daily habits, altering your function, affecting your sleep and your sleep quality, um, it's remembering that you need to seek out report, uh, support, and that could be starting with your oncology care team. That could be reaching out to a mental health uh, provider as well, um, looking into options like Psychology Today, going through your insurance company, or finding a resource here at Yale as well. So I've mentioned a few times the importance of discussing it with your care team, fear of cancer recurrence, that it is. So what are some key takeaways when we think about talking about FCR? First and foremost, as I've mentioned, it's bringing it up. Don't be afraid to bring it up because it's not the most talked about topic, um, especially in routine follow-up visits. Um, so if you're feeling like you're having this increased level of fear of cancer recurrence, anxiety from it, um, it's, it's altering your daily life that's when you should definitely be bringing that up to your care team or even bringing it to our clinic, for example, the survivorship clinic. Um, and again, highlighting here that it is common um, and normal for a cancer survivor to have fear of cancer recurrence. So um, going back to Kelsey uh, and what she said at one point, uh, having sometimes some level of shame associated with it, we really wanna normalize this experience and, and recognize that it's okay to have that um, emotion and that there isn't uh, a reason to feel ashamed for having it. Um, fear of cancer recurrence can be a barrier to daily function, healthy lifestyle behaviors, as I mentioned before. So overcoming that can sometimes allow for you to live your best life. And um, you know we, we know that it can inhibit these things like exercise and physical activity, nutrition, and things like that. So it's important to work on this sometimes as a first step before even being able to move on to those other healthy lifestyle behaviors. And it can also be a barrier for follow-up recommendations uh, with cancer care and other healthcare needs as well, um, such as, you know, again, uh, what some people call scanxiety associated with going for follow-up imaging or, um, you know, anxiety associated with going for follow-up visits. And I always wanna make sure I'm crediting people when they are doing those things because it's so important to keep up with those needs moving forward after your treatment and after your diagnosis. And uh, again, making sure you're reaching out to professionals to help manage severe fear of recurrence and talking about it regularly will help reduce that stigma. And that stigma being that, you know, concern that this isn't normal, that there's shame associated with it, when in reality it is normal and it's okay to be talking about these things. And so it's important to stay informed too, to help further reduce fear of cancer recurrent, recurrence. Um, sometimes just having a conversation about what you might be unclear on um, with your care team is important. So I encourage you all, and you'll notice a theme right here in this slide, discuss your diagnosis, discuss concerning signs or symptoms for recurrence if you're uncertain about those and what those could be versus what are maybe some symptoms that aren't related to uh, potential disease recurrence. And if you're uncertain about any of that, just ask. That's why we're here. That's why we're all here tonight. It's to answer your questions. It's as best that we can. And your care team is there, whether it's through a MyChart message or a phone call to the clinic. Healthy lifestyle behaviors can also help reduce risk of cancer recurrence and other cancers uh, from developing. Avoiding smoking, limiting alcohol use, keeping up with routine exercise and physical activity. Um, and Heather will get into that a bit more after me here, but um, you know, we know that there are a number of cancers, not, uh, not just one or a few that benefit from exercise. And then healthy nutrition. Um, you know, you need to nourish your body to be able to stay active um, and, and maintain a healthy lifestyle. 
And then continue to review follow-up schedules and surveillance with your oncology care team and how often you should be going back for imaging, labs, and follow-up visits. And if you have questions about any of that, never be afraid to ask. So um, thank you. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to me. I hope to leave you with some healing uh, imagery here of our Smilo Healing Garden. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Jeff. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Work. Y'all can tell me if you are seeing my slides. Yeah, okay, great. So again, I'm Heather Studwell. Um, I am the Oncology Survivorship Program Coordinator down here at Smilo Cancer Care Center at Greenwich Hospital. Um, I am an occupational therapist by trade. I'm a certified um, oncology rehab therapist, and I'm also a board certified lymphedema therapist. Um, I've been down here for about 20 plus years now, so um, it's been a while. So I'm going to start to talk about how a few strategies, a few things that you can do um, to help alleviate some of the fear of recurrence. And those two specific things are uh, nutrition and exercise. Um, so, you know, nutritional worries can contribute to your fear of cancer recurrence. Was it something that I ate that gave me my cancer? Um, is there something that I will eat that will cause my cancer to return? Um, does sugar feed my cancer? This is, these are questions that we hear a lot in our survivorship clinic down here. Um, when I'm treating patients, these are their concerns. Um, and, you know, does sugar feed my cancer? The answer is no, it doesn't. Um, you know, for men, a healthy amount of daily sugar intake is about nine teaspoons or 35 grams. Just a, a little tidbit of information. Um, that's, that's a healthy amount for you to have. Um, you know, we don't want our patients, we don't want our survivors or anybody going through their cancer treatments to fear food. Um, you know, food is controllable. Food is enjoyable. It shouldn't be feared. Um, it's your ally. It's your, you know, it's something that can be used to, to help you get through your cancer treatments. And to help survive after your cancer treatments. Um, but most importantly, um, I encourage you to ask your provider for a referral to see a dietitian um, who specializes in oncology care. Um, you can call our Smilo Cancer Hospital Nutrition Department. Um, we have dietitians at all of our cancer care centers throughout Connecticut and Rhode Island who can help answer some of your questions that you have about, you know, what, what foods are good to eat, what foods are not. These are dietitians who specialize in oncology care, and they know, um, you know, specifically if you're trying to lose weight or, you know, but you don't want to eat this. And, you know, there are ways to um, eat healthy um, that will help. And I think knowing the right things to do um, you know, people always say, I thought I was doing the right things and then I got cancer. Well, you were, um, but you have to be reassured that those are the right things to do. Um, so we can, at the end, um, in the chat, we'll put the telephone numbers for contact information for nutrition departments. And as Jemin said, we have survivorship um, services throughout the um, cancer care centers as well, who can also connect you with these dietitians. So exercise, um, so this is a healthy lifestyle or behavior that can have a, that has a strong correlation to reducing your fear of recurrence. Um, just recently in 2018, the American College of Sports Medicine, um, after many years of research, have finally put out the first set of guidelines that presents the effects of exercise on health-related outcomes which includes cancer prevention, prevention, sorry. So the slide that you see now is for all adults, exercise is important for cancer prevention and specifically will lower the risk in seven 
of the most common types of cancers, which you'll see here. Um, what also came out of these uh, studies that they did were this, this little box down here, which I'm going to um, highlight um, in a second. I'll get to the next slide, but for right now, for just cancer prevention and, and treatment, the, the amount of exercise that these guidelines are for are 150, 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise or 75 minutes per week of vigorous cardiovascular exercise. Um, 150 minutes a week, 30 minutes, five times a week, it breaks down to of moderate exercise. Moderate exercise is um, your, you can, can't really carry on a conversation, you're out of breath, but you, you, can, you can talk. Um, vigorous exercise would be, you wouldn't be able to have a conversation. Um, and let's go to my next slide, Heather. Um, so that's the general physical activity recommendation for cancer survivors. And you work your way up to 300 minutes per week um, or at least 75 to 150 minutes plus two times a week of resistive or strengthening exercises. And those are your basic guidelines for cancer survivors. Um, and now I'm gonna go to those that little bottom box that I pointed out earlier. And in here, from all of those studies, these were this isn't what they were researching, but this is what they found. And other outcomes that came out was that exercise during your cancer treatment not only decreased your fatigue levels, but it also decreased feelings of anxiety and depression. Um, and that's what came out of that. But for us tonight, one of the more important things that came out of it was that for cancer survivors, incorporating exercise improved survival after a diagnosis of breast cancer, colon cancer, and most specifically of prostate cancer. Um, unfortunately, because that's not what they were looking for when they were doing these studies, they didn't really give us a dose or how much exercise like we had in that previous slide for prevention and treatment. But um, the general guidelines still apply. Um, so meeting that minimum of 150 minutes per week of moderate or 75 minutes a week of vigorous exercise, plus the two times a week of resistance helped with survival in prostate cancers. Um, now, if we're looking at fear of recurrence, anxiety, and depression, how much exercise is enough? Well, there's very strong evidence found for aerobic exercise, cardiovascular exercise, riding a bicycle, walking on a treadmill, um, three times a week, for 60, I'm sorry, three times a week for 30 to 60 minutes per session of moderate to vig vigorous showed strong evidence of reducing your anxiety and depression. There's also strong evidence that aerobic cardiovascular plus resistance for two to three times a week for 20 to 40 minutes of moderate to vigorous plus two times a week of resistance so that meant strength training two times a week, two sets of 18 to 12 reps for large muscle groups um, had strong evidence. Um, the only thing that had really insufficient evidence during these studies um, that they'll do more on was if you just did strengthening exercises. So the really the best effect was cardiovascular aerobic exercise plus strength training. Um, okay. So how do you get started? Well, we want you to talk to your physician. You always need to be cleared before you start any kind of exercise program. Um, you know, do you need a stress test? Do you want to be in a hospital-based facility exercise program, or could you go to a fitness center like LA Fitness? Um, setting realistic goals for the beginning. And you know, do you want or need a personal trainer to help motivate you? Um, you know, we want you to avoid inactivity and return to normal daily activities 
as soon as possible after diagnosis and really get yourself motivated and moving again. Um, always, we always caution people to start slowly and build up to that amount of physical activity over time, build up to that dose. We don't want you to just go out and start if you're weak from all of your treatments, if your muscles, if you've had muscle loss or um, effects from radiation treatment, you know, we want you to build it up. You can exercise several times a week for at least 10 minutes and build up over time. Uh, one of my favorite slides that I like to show everybody when I tell them when I'm talking about physical activity are, you know, these little things that you can do to move and that count as part of your exercise. So taking a walk after dinner, mowing the grass or raking the leaves instead of using a blower, wash your car instead of going to the car wash, um, walk your dog, but make sure that it's one that won't pull you so you don't trip and fall. Um, weed your garden, you know, use an exercise bike or a treadmill while you're watching a TV show. Um, park your car the furthest in the furthest parking space at work or at the store and walk to the building. Um, use stairs instead of an elevator. Um, form a walking club with coworkers or neighbors to help you stay motivated during the day. Uh, make appointments with yourself, for yourself in your daily planner to walk 10 minutes and take breaks every once in a while. Play active games with your children or your grandchildren, and I'm gonna date myself, but say, play freeze tag with them. It's a little bit of running and it's a little bit of rest standing still. Um, play those games, teach them those games. So, but we played when we were kids. Um, and dancing, dancing is one of my favorites. And I know most men will just roll their eyes, but you can do it when nobody's watching. And um, one of my favorite personal stories with dancing is my aunt and uncle um, in their early 70s decided they were going to take ballroom dancing lessons, um, which was really kind of cool. And they, they outdanced us all at future family weddings and continue to do so. Um, and those, all of those activities all count as exercise and it will help to improve your fatigue. It helps improve your quality of life, improve your physical function, reduce your anxiety or depression. It will help if you have lymphedema. Um, it will improve your survival. Um, you know, reducing stress is an important part of getting well and we want you to stay well. Um, so we want you to keep it safe, keep it fun, make it work for you. You know, remember your goal is to stay active because it will help with your survival from prostate cancer. Um, so, you know, you can, when you starting an exercise program, you can seek out the guidance of there are professionals um, who, there are exercise physiologists who specialize not only in uh, exercise, but there are exercise physiologists who specialize in oncology care as well. Um, you know, what's exercises for an, person who's had cancer or has cancer is may look a little bit different than somebody who doesn't. Um, there are physical and occupational therapists who are certified in oncology care. At Greenwich Hospital, we have exercise physiologists who run a medical fitness program, and um, they will give you an individualized supervised exercise program um, as well. So there are these services available. Um, hopefully, with all of this research that's coming out, we will see um, more and more in the future. And um, before we take some more questions, I just want to go to my next slide, which says thank you, everybody. And just to remind you that next Monday, we have our third Smilo Shares in the series, which is um, going to be hosted by Dr. Honig on intimacy and prostate cancer. So I will end my slideshow, figure out how to stop sharing my screen, and we'll take some questions. So let's see. Um, okay, so it looks like some, we have, we had a few, I know because this is recorded, some people can't see the, um, questions that pop up in the question and answer. 
I saw a few earlier that I thought would be worth just sharing. And maybe even though they were answered in the question and answer, maybe we can um, just have you guys reiterate what you wrote. So we had somebody that had a question for Dr. Sprinkle. Does recurrence greatly decrease after the first year of undetectable PSA levels following a radical prostatectomy? You want to want me to read your answer, or you want? To... Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm typing another answer Sorry. at the moment. So if you, if you want to read it, that'd be great. And then I'm okay. happy to yeah follow uh, up. So his response to that was, "We're most concerned about an early recurrence." So monitor intensively for the first few years, but we will monitor a man's PSA for 20 years after treatment. And Dr. Petrolak may have additional comments on that. I mean, typically we do, the risk after a year does not go to zero. I mean, quite honestly, after radiation therapy, um, we often, there's a window of several years where we do not expect to really see any significant changes. Um, so we often are following for several years and while the risk may go down some, there still unfortunately is a risk after that, but the, the major risk is in the first few years, probably after surgery, we're most concerned for about two or three years after radiation, there's a period about three, to, I would say five years. Um, Dan, I don't know if you have more specific numbers than that. That's kind of my sense. The, the risk goes down significantly after two years. And, um, but I have seen people relapse 10 years, 12 years afterwards. Um, so, you know, the question is after five years, how closely should somebody be followed? And that's really controversial. There's really no right or wrong answer to that. Um, but one thing I think also that we have to keep in mind so for those patients who've undergone combination therapy with radiation and hormones or hormone therapy to have stopped hormone therapy, that there's going to be a lag time before testosterone begins to rise. And an average of 18 to 24 months, some situations, it's a 50-50 shot that your testosterone is going to come back. And it's proportional to the testosterone level that you started at, as well as less likely the older you are. But that's sort of the fuel on the fire, so to speak. And you may not see anything until that T level comes back up again. So, so those are things that you need to keep in mind. And I always get concerned when I see studies where they talk about three years of engine deprivation therapy being the same thing as you know two or one. Really, the issue is a, an issue of recovery of testosterone as well. So that's actually an important issue. So we have another question um, it could be for either one of the docs. Um, can a low grade one, I'm oh, sorry, the low grade one prostate cancer remain a grade one permanently without getting worse? Or is the normal progression to get worse? So I can take that. So grade one um, prostate cancers are low grade and we very often our national guidelines now recommend deferral of treatment or not no, not treating that level of cancer. Um, and that is because now we have studies with 10 to 14 years of follow up um, that suggest that less than half or maybe half of men on surveillance will receive treatment within that 10 year time frame. Um, there are also very good studies that show an absence of any survival benefit when comparing men who were treated versus those who were not uh, with up to 10 years of follow-up and even some studies up to 20 years of follow-up. So there's a very large number of men with low grade one prostate cancer that may never need treatment. Thank you. Um, so we have a question that I'm going to paraphrase and um, Jevin, you can probably jump in here too. The patient that's uh, housebound um, has some balance issues and is trying to figure out how to interact with the system um, with dizziness and needs some care. Um, my suggestion would be if you if you can't get out of your home the very easily, you 
probably would qualify for home care where practitioners, physical therapists, occupational therapists um, can come to your home and help you uh, work on those balance issues. Um, I know the ototoxicity um, is probably sometimes um, dizziness, you know, that also can be addressed um, probably more. They can, would have to be addressed outside of the home, but um, those balance issues. Do you agree, Jevin? You know, getting I home care. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, Heather. And, um, you know, I would encourage you, um, you know, to, to, to reach out to your care team and talk, talk about setting up home services uh, for that purpose. And, you know, the nice thing is, too, um, if you wanted to have, say, like a survivorship clinic visit with our team, um, we do te offer telehealth as well. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're uh, within the state of Connecticut because of licenses, um, you can certainly, um, you know, see us still even via telehealth. Um, but I would definitely also reach out to your primary, you know, urology team or oncology team and talk about, um, you know, setting up home services. And, you know, he did say also that he can drive short distances, but we do, you know, we have scattered services around Connecticut that include physical therapy, um, occupational therapy, social workers um, that you can tap into no matter where you are. And many of them, even our physical therapy departments can offer um, some kind of telehealth for follow-up visits. They obviously need to meet you in person um, as well, but they can do some follow-up visits. And um, But our survivorship services, you know, they're they're specialized, but they're also physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, social workers, nutritionists. Um, we just all have trained in oncology care. Um, anybody, any more questions? Hold on. Oh, we got another one. So what are the percentages? This is for either of the, the docs on. What are the percentages of recurrence after surgery? and follow up with hormone and radiation due to metastases upon biopsy. So that uh, seems like a straightforward question, but it's actually pretty complicated. So the, the recurrence risk depends very largely on the grade and stage of the cancer. Um, and so intermediate risk cancers, the likelihood of needing hormones and radiation therapy within 10 years is relatively low, maybe 15 to 20% can even be lower than that. Um, for high grade cancers, especially those if there are metastases, um, uh, it depends on where the metastases are, but nodal metastases um, or more that then your the rate of needing radiation hormone therapy is typically greater than 80%. So there's a, a pretty wide uh, variety. Okay, and then our last question, because we are getting close to the top of the hour. Um, what is the recommended frequency for testing for the presence of prostate cancer after one year of the completion of radiation and hormone treatment? I typically recommend every six months um, at this time frame. I don't know, Dr. Petrolak, if you would say anything different. Um, that's yeah. usually what we do for a few more years. It depends upon, I think, the risk. You know, if yeah. somebody's high risk, I probably would treat would every three months check a PSA. Uh, but that's that's really the standard or frequency is is I think really up to the physician, whether it's more of a individual matters. Some patients want to be checked more, more frequently. Um, just another, another, just a little quick aside before we go, there's a great book um, uh, called The Strong Path. It's about exercise and longevity and uh, weightlifting. And um, it's actually um, written by a lawyer, a friend of mine, I'm just blanking on his name right now. Uh, oh. But uh, um, um, Fred Bartlett, excuse me. And it's it's a great book on exercise and how it's made a difference in his life. He's 86 years old. And he looks like he's 60. Oh my so gosh. We all should read it. Yeah, exactly. We should all exercise as much as we should. Um, even the minimum. Okay, we have put in, um, there is 
an email if you have any questions. Um, you can always email our cancer answers at yale.edu. It's in the chat. Um, I know that um, Kelsey gave her contact information. Um, Jevin and I put our contact information in there. I believe there was a question about emails. We can um, email you our slides. I'm happy to do that. I know there were a few people who asked for the slides. Happy to do that. Um, if you would send your emails to cancer answers, plural, um, at yale.edu, and we will send out the slides and the link um, for you to look over again. And let's see, any other last, just looking to see if there's any other questions. I think we answered them all. Um, right, are we good here? We are, all right. So if there are no more questions, I will um, leave the chat up for a few more minutes. Thank everybody for being on tonight. Thank you to all of our panelists for taking the time to share your knowledge and information tonight. And we will look forward to seeing everybody next Monday night again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.